Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see you. Only two said happy Sabbath. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's good to be here. It's good to see you all at church this morning. Um, I'm not feeling too great. I'm feeling a bit sickish. Um, I, I have a pain which the doctors can't figure out. Um, but luckily, as you know, Joel is here. So I said to him, he needs to be ready at a drop of a hat. He said he'll only preach if I pass out. So if you see me passing out, don't stress, Dr. Nick is here, we have a few nurses, I'll fall down, they'll take me away, Joel will come up. And the good thing is that I'm preaching a new series on conflict, and as pastors, we deal with conflict all the time, so he says he's got a lot of stories, so you're in good hands. Um, it's good to be here, I see a lot of visitors here, welcome to Kingscliff Church, my name is Pastor Quinton, I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Um, I know some have come for the Kingscliff Try, and I know some of our members, Alex is doing the Try tomorrow, let's pray for them. Um, it's good to be here. Did everybody have a good week? Yeah? I, uh, uh, I went to Sydney with my wife for a few days, and man, it is just so good to enjoy still this good weather. Coming back, we realized how nice and warm it is here compared to Sydney. Coming back, we were like, oh man, we had to just shed our jackets and everything. It's so great to live on this side um, of Australia. So we're going to start a series, a new series or sermon collection for the next few weeks on, on church and um, culture and conflict and how to deal with some of these things. As, as church members, we always, and not just church members, as human beings, I think there's always this idea that um, conflict needs to be addressed, and that's true, but how we address it is the question, and that's kind of one of the things that we will look at. But before we start, let's just maybe close our eyes for another prayer. Gracious Father, we come to you and we pray, Lord, that you'll be with us now. Lord, as we saw in that video, Lord, it's not over until it's over. And for many of us, Lord, there might be portions in our lives or conflicts with people that we think this is over, this relationship is over, or this, this thing is just, it's done and dusted. But Lord, we know that we have to go and forgive and, 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 and live the kingdom values out, Lord, that might be different, different than this world. We might be able to um, redeem and, and reconcile, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and so, Lord, now for, for the next few weeks, as we look and study your word and see what is these premises that we should build our faith on, on our hope, and on our ethics on, in terms of co uh, conflict and dealing with this culture of the world versus the culture of scripture and your church, Lord, I pray that we would have the clarity of thought and that you would change our hearts and our minds, Lord, to be like you, to think like you, and to act like you. Lord, this is a thing that we generally would mentally maybe assent to, to say, yeah, this is how Christians should act, but yet we don't always act this way. And all of us are guilty of this, Lord. All of us have acted in ways that are improper and um, ways that are unloving. But I pray that your spirit will, in the next few weeks, Lord, bring to mind the things that we need to change, the people that we need to speak to, that we would see that this is truly the way to live, not merely as Christians, but as human beings that it is within our DNA, Lord, to be a people that connect with each other, that want to live in harmony, even though we struggle with that. Be with us now in Jesus' name, amen. There's a, a, a monastery that ha makes a vow of silence, so they never speak except one day out of the year on Christmas Day, one of them can say something. And so the rest of the year, 365 days, they don't speak. But on that day, on Christmas Day, one of the monks can say something. So it, it came, up, uh, came to that day of the year that they had a beautiful meal, special meal, a meal that they don't have every day. And they had the special meal. And it was uh, um, the one monk's time to speak. And so Brother Thomas spoke up and says, oh, I love Christmas time. And I find these mashed potatoes are so delicious. Thank you. And another year went past, 365 days of silence. Nobody said a word. Eventually, we came to Christmas again. And so Brother Paul opened his mouth. And he said, well, a matter of factly, I think that the potatoes are a bit lumpy. Thank you very much. And so another year went by of silence, no speaking. Eventually, the next Christmas came, and they had the same potatoes. And eventually, Brother Matthew opened his mouth and said, guys, I cannot take this bickering anymore. Please stop. <laughs> now, whether you're in the church or whether you're not in the church, whether you're a Christian, whether you're not a Christian, whether you're from wherever, I think it's, it's human to know that there's going to be conf conflict, right? 
There's a verse in the Bible that says, where two or three are gathered, there I will be. Uh, that verse, I think, could also say, where two or three are gathered, there will be conflict. Right? Whether it's in the family, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's at work, whether it's in your personal life, conflict will be there. The question for Christians is, how do we deal with that conflict? As Christians, we are called to deal with conflict differently because of the way that Christ has redeemed us and the way that he calls us. There's a vision that he has about how Christians should conduct themselves in this world when it comes to conflict. When we read certain verses, verses like this one in Ephesians chapter four, we see the echoes of these things as Paul the apostle, one of the, the main teachers in scripture, he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Now Ephesians, if you're, if you're not a, uh, aware, Ephesians was a port city, and so there were lots of different people there. There were rich people and poor people, there were um, older people and younger people, there were Asians and Europeans, there were just a host of different people, Jews and Gentiles, and so obviously there was a lot of conflict and obviously there was a lot of disunity. And one of the main things in the book of Ephesians is this idea of disunity, and Paul coming to teach about what unity is within the church. And so he addresses this, and he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. What do you think was happening in the church in Ephesus? People were talking badly about each other. So he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is a good thing for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So he's saying these actions that you are doing, speaking ill of people and, and doing this, this is grieving the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So he's giving this idea and he's saying these things are happening there. There are people that have bitterness against each other. Have you experienced bitterness in your life against people? Do you think that there's sometimes bitterness in this church? Let, the, let, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. What is clamor? Clamor is trying to seek for something that you don't have, power or status or, 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 or position or, 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 or uh, whatever it is. You're clamoring for something that you don't have. And slander, what is slander? Slander is when you assassinate somebody's character, when you break them down in front of other people. We would say it's gossip. Be put away from you along with all malice. Does this seem countercultural to you? Yes or no? Because I think it's natural for us when we are slighted, when we are angry, when we are hurt, that we operate in these ways, that we have bitterness, that we have wrath, that we have anger, that we want to clamor, that we slander people. Oh, did you see what they said? Or oh, did you see how they acted? This is the general way that we as human beings act. And Paul says, no, 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 but as Christians, you should act differently than the way that you naturally act. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So here comes the basis. He says, this is how you should, should act because this is the way that God, who is the one that is the most offended party in the cosmic universe, acts towards you, the offender. He continues. Um, yeah, sorry, he doesn't continue. Uh, Joel said to me that I should just let the meds speak. So that might have been the meds speaking. So I want to speak about separation in church and state. And if you think about history, I, I saw this meme the other day. If you think about history, this is, a, this is a encapsulation of church or human history, right? This idea that your people are different than mine, and I don't like that kind of thing. Right? The, people, the people in Ephesus were saying, man, people are different here, and I don't like that. The Europeans were saying, oh, I don't really like these Asian people that are coming into the church. The Gentiles were saying, I don't like the way the, Gentiles, the Jews are doing these things, right? The rich people were saying, hey, I don't like it that these slaves can talk the way that they want to talk. I don't like the difference that is there. Generally, when there's conflict, it's because there's difference. Human history, and even today, when we look at all kind of history or the kind of issues that are in the world today, it's because of the various differences that are there, politically, economically, all the, all the conflict that is there. Recently, I was reading this book of a lady that uh, works for a think tank that works with extremist, gr extremist groups. So she, what she tries to do is she tries to um, work with various agencies and tell them, hey, listen, yeah, this is a, an issue that you need to be aware of. You know, this is extremist group that might be, become violent, you know, whatever. But one of the things that what the book is about is that she looks at, um, she infiltrates these groups. So whether it is uh, jihadist groups or ISIS groups or whether it is uh, uh, groups that has to do with nationalism, neo-Nazis or whatever, and 
she infiltrates them and then she tries to figure out what is going on, what is the thing. And one of the key things in, in each chapter, she discusses each of these things. And one of the key things that she sees there is that all of these people feel that they are the people that have everything right, their views, their perspectives, their paradigms, they have truth, and everybody else that's different than them needs to come into line with their thinking. But isn't that a sense how all of us operate sometimes? We think that we're always in the middle, that we have all the right perspectives, that, that we know what is right and what is wrong. And so if there's conflict, generally the other person needs to step into line. And so when we come to scripture, we see that that, that changes the perspective for us. Jesus says in Matthew chapter five that Christians should be peacemakers. Peacemakers that, that make peace. And even this concept of making peace is different than the way that we necessarily think what it means to be a peacemaker. Generally, when we think about peacemaking or resolving conflict, we think that we need to be a doormat that people just walk over, that we should flee from conflict, that we should just keep our mouth shut and let peace just reign. But that's not necessarily what Jesus means. Because if you think about this, this idea says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be the sons of God. The son of God, the ultimate son of God, Jesus Christ, is called the king of peace. But when he came, he said at certain times that I don't just bring peace, but I bring a sword. In the same passage, Jesus says that you will be persecuted for your faith. He speaks about conflict that will come. So even these concepts, and that's the beauty of the, the, the gospel for me, is that it subverts our ideas of peace and conflict, of power and status, of honor and shame. It helps us rethink these concepts so that when we engage in these things, and we should engage in these things, it will be different than, than the way that we necessarily grew up in. Paul, echoing these ideas we've already spoken about, Ephesians chapter four, echoes the same thing in 2 Corinthians where he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now it's getting to the base thing. If you are this new creation, in Christ, because you have died to self and you're resurrected anew, you will start acting differently. You will start viewing the world differently. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled himself. And this is a key thing. God himself, the source of all goodness, he has been offended by humanity. We transgressed, we brought sin in this world, we have this iniquity. We have transgressed against him. We have raised our fist towards him. We have said, we don't need you anymore. And yet he took the step towards us to reconcile us. So here's the archetypal uh, uh, um, mo kind of way of showing reconciliation. He steps into our world. He comes towards us, us and reconciles us. And then he says, but then he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now let me ask you this, this ministry of reconciliation, to whom is it given? Is it given to pastors? Yes or no? Yes, it's given to pastors. Is it given to elders? Yes. Is it given to deacons? Yes. Is it given to the whole church? Yes, this is not a spiritual gift that some people have this spiritual gift and other people have other spiritual gifts. Some people have the spiritual gift of teaching and some don't. Some have the spiritual gift of hospitality and others don't. Some have this, the spiritual gift of evangelism and others don't. Some people have different spiritual gifts and others don't. But this is not a spiritual gift. What he is saying is that if you are a Christian, and you have experienced the grace of Christ and the mercy of Christ and the long suffering of Christ, you have experienced the blood of Christ cleansing you from your sin and your transgression and your evil and all the things that you have done wrong, then now you should act in the same way that Christ has acted towards you. Meaning that you are now called into this ministry of reconciliation. So it is the work of everybody that calls their name Christ, Christian in the name of Christ to say that I am also involved in this ministry of reconciliation. He continues, he says, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. There were two kind of regions or places where people would live during the Roman time. There were senatorial um, places or, or governments where the senators would live, and these are people that were generally in favor of Roman rule. So they were happy. This was the regions that were happy that the Romans were there. 
But then there were imperial regions. An imperial region is a region that was against Rome. They didn't like Rome being there. And so they would constantly want to fight against Rome. And so what Rome would do is that they would send ambassadors to this area, to imperial regions, to show and to live out the virtues of Rome. Paul, knowing that, uses the same word ambassador and says that you, you have experienced the kingdom of Jesus Christ in your life when he came and redeemed you from your sin. You have experienced grace that you have not merited. You have certain uh, things that you have because God is favorable to you, not because you're good, but because he's good. And now that you've experienced this grace and this mercy, you are now called to, as an ambassador to go into the world that is not an imperial king, not a kingdom that is for him. It's like the imperial re re regions that are against him. You go into those places and you, and you show the love of Christ. In other words, the vision that Jesus has of the church is that the church should be an alternative community that the world looks at the church and says, man, how is it that those people that are so different in every other way, just like us, operate different than us in the way that they sort out their conflict, the way that they deal with their issues, the way that they work out their dramas? Now question, do you think that that is a reality in our world? Do you think you as a Christian live this kind of virtue? these kingdom principles? Or do you think that we can do better as Christians? That we need to, to, to develop these skills of dealing with conflict. Like think about this, how many of you were taught one plus one is two? Like how many of you went to school to learn one plus one is two? Yeah, can I say that? Yeah. How many of you had to learn that the, that the mitochondria makes ATP and it's the powerhouse of the cell? How many of you learned that? Like you, you didn't just know that, right? You had to learn that in biology. How many of you ever had a class on how to deal with conflict? Like, generally, this is one of the most important things as human beings that we need to, to, to figure out is how to deal with conflict in our lives, yet we don't have a lot of classes on that. And so for the next few weeks, that's what we want to focus on is how do we deal with conflict? How do we, what, what are the steps? What are the right paradigms and perspectives that we need to have when we deal with, with, with uh, conflict? Because this is super important for Jesus, because we have this ministry of reconciliation that we need to go out and be ambassadors to the world. He continues, he says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The, the ministry of reconciliation is very closely connected to our work and our redemption. Ellen White says this, she says, our unity and love for one another are the credentials, the ambassador badge, by which we testify to the world that God sent his son to save sinners. Let that sink in. Our unity and love for each other, the way that we deal with people that just grate us and irritate us, the way that we deal with this, that is the credentials by which we testify to the world that God has sent his son to save sinners. The world will look at Christians and be like, wow, there is something there that we don't have. This is so unnatural for them to act this way, but yet they act this way. There must be some power at work within them. They have experienced something that I am seeking, that I am longing for. There's something that I need in my life, the grace of Jesus that is in their lives that makes them operate in a way that is out of this world. The ministry of reconciliation. Jesus says this in John chapter 30, 13, verse 35, by, all, by this all people will know that you are my, my disciples, by the way that you know the 28 fundamental beliefs, by the way that you cook your vegan beans. No, no, no the way that you, people will know that you are my disciples on, is on which day you worship, by how well you, you know the 10 commandments. Now those things are important, I'm not saying those things are not important, but you can know and not know. This is how they know, the way that you love one another. The way that 1 Corinthians 13 is exemplified by your hands towards each other. The ministry of reconciliation. 
Miroslav Wolf speaks about the way that the world operates. Now, the way that the world operates, if I had to ask you the way that the world operates, what would be that? If, you get, if you're in a conflict situation in a worldly way or in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that humanity generally operates, what would we use the word for that? Right? We would say, oh, they did this, I'm going to do this. Like, I'll get them back. They'll know who they're up against. Oh, they won't speak to me about that. Like, we call that revenge. We speak about getting back at them, right? An eye for an eye. He speaks about this idea, revenge. Now, Miroslav Wolf is a Croatian um, uh, um, theologian, and he, he knows war. He knows about a civil war and war that has happened. So he writes this He's in his book, Exclusion and Embrace. He says, revenge doesn't say an eye for an eye, even though that's what they would say sometimes, but that's not what it means. Revenge doesn't say eye for an eye. What he's saying here is that we say an eye for an eye, but what revenge actually says is a lot more than that. It always escalates. Revenge doesn't say an eye for an eye. It says, you take my eye, I'll blow your brains out, right? It doesn't say an insult for an insult. It says, you cross me once and and you cross me twice, I'll destroy your character and your career. Do we see that today? Cancel culture? It doesn't say you organize an act of terror and we'll punish you. No, no, no. It says you organize an act of terror and we will use an overwhelming military force of a superpower to recast the political landscape of an entire region from which you came. Long sentence, but true, isn't it? Do you think that there's a vast difference by the way that Jesus tells us to operate and the way that the world operates? For sure. And so our work for the next few weeks, as I said, will be to really flesh that out. What does that mean? Not just theologically so that we can say, oh, yeah, now I know a bit more on what the Bible says about conflict, but so that we can actually deal with conflict in a way that would honor Christ in our lives. So what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go and try and understand conflict today. Today will be just an introductory uh, kind of platform. We'll just kind of lay the ground for understanding conflict. And what we'll talk about is what is conflict, what causes conflict, and how should Christians respond to conflict? Just those three things. Um, and then for the next few weeks, we'll kind of un- flesh a bit more out of this, uh, more of this out. So the first question is, what is conflict? To understand something, we have to understand the definitions. What is conflict really, right? So conflict is the difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates or disagrees with someone's goals or desires. So it means that there are two people that have a goal, it might be the same goal, but the way that they think that they should get there doesn't work out. Or they have different goals and it's just at odds with each other, right? Now something, conflict is not a bad thing. Conflict isn't a bad thing. It's the way that you deal with the conflict, right? Sometimes you you come up to very good conflict. For instance, this week my wife and I went away for a few days and, you know, we had conflict about where we should eat. The one night she said to me, I want to have Indian. I said, I don't like Indian because I don't like spicy food. So we were in conflict. What are we going to have, pasta or Indian, right? But then I thought, let me go with the Indian. And I was glad that I went with the Indian, right? But we had a little bit of a conflict. Where should we go, right? Now, sometimes it's something small and petty, like where should we go to a restaurant? And sometimes it's big things, right? So the, the issue is not necessarily the conflict. It's the way that we deal with the conflict. Right? Conflict is also a situation in which two or more human beings desire goals in which they perceive are being attainable by one or the other, but not by both. And that's the reason why conflict comes up. It's not like, okay, your plan works and my plan works. No, no, it's like, we need to get you or I want to get you and whatever you do is going to curtail what I want to do. It's not going to get me to my goal and I know that my goal is attainable. Right, and and so conflict can be many things. Conflict also occurs in the church. Um, Larry McSwain and, and William Treadwell says this, conflict occurs most often in the congregations in which there is a deep commitment to the church. Sometimes conflict that happens within the church is because, not because people are laissez-faire about the church, it's actually because they're really committed to good things. They're really committed to the church. They really feel a deep desire for, for God and for His church and for the mission. And so this deep desire for something meets another person that has a deep desire for something and they clash. But let me ask you this, should our our adherence or our love or our commitment to the church be greater than our commitment to Jesus? Which one should be first, our commitment to the church or our commitment to Jesus? To Jesus. And so when Jesus says, this is the way that you should deal with conflict, we should say, hey, maybe my commitment to the church or my perceived commitment on how church should operate 
should take a back seat and I should first be committed to the way that Jesus tells me to deal with conflict within the church. That changes the perspective, doesn't it, on how we should deal with conflict within the church and with outside of the church if you're a Christian. So what causes conflict? What are the reasons that we, we bring conflict to the fore? Now, there's uh, various things. First one is the attitudes, the attitudes that we bring, right? So these are differences in feelings and perspectives, prejudice, prejudice stereotypes, or particular beliefs. So these can be, can, can be various things that we have within ourselves. This is not what it's somebody else is doing. This is an attitude problem. This is something that I have, a perspective that I have, a prejudice that I have, right? It could be also sin that I have, right? So James says this, James chapter four verse one says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights amongst you? Amongst you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So he's saying that there's this perspective. Firstly, it's the sin within us, but also this idea that, that we want this, but we cannot have this. So we think that we need to have this and we can get this. And this is, this is owed to me in a sense. We have this attitude of, of entitlement. You're asking, you do not receive because you ask wrongly and spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is its enmity with God? So saying this idea of thinking like the world and the passions of the world, if you have this concept, it will create certain attitudes and prejudices and thinking within your heart that will lead you to desire certain things and that will create conflict within yourself, maybe even with God or even amongst each other. So the first thing that we can speak about is this idea of attitudes. The next one is more substantive issues, right? So this is a difference of opinion about facts, goals, ends or means. Right, this is a way that we can, we can really have in conflict over legitimate things, things that are real, factual things. Right? Sometimes there's strife over, over, over needs or wants. Right? Have you ever had a strife within your family on how to use the finances? I think it should be spent this way. No, 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 I think it should be spent this way. Right? We have a, a story in, in Scripture in Genesis chapter 13 this is, and Lot went with Abraham and, so, um, and had flocks and herds and tents, so the land could not support both of them um, dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Here's a problem that is creating out of great wealth, right? They have lots of stuff, and so the people are fighting, the, the herdsmen are fighting. And there was strife between them, between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of, li uh, of Lot's livestock, Right? So how do we use this? How do we use the, the possessions that we have, the limited resources that we have? There was only so much grazing field. So who gets it? How does it work? Do you think that we still struggle? Or do you think that there's still conflict over resources or limited resources? How many wars have been fought over oil? How many wars have been fought over minerals? How many people have been dispossessed from their lands, killed for resources? Do we fight over resources? Resources is not necessarily money. Resources could be status. You know, if everybody's on the same level, you know, then we don't fight for status. But because we have this idea that there's a pecking order, we want to go higher and there can only be so few at the top. And so we fight for, for the power and prestige to get up. So there's limited status and there's limited power and we want that. So we fight over those things. We, we quarrel over those things. Think about your life. Think about the conflict that you have had in the last week. Maybe you haven't had quarrels or conflict this last week. Think about the last two weeks. Think about the last month. What has been the source of the conflict in your life? Is it an attitude thing? That you have certain perspectives and pre prejudices? Is it a substantive thing? An opinion that you have? A factual thing that you think this is? Right? Is it a, an emotional thing? Something that you link towards these two. So an emotional uh, conflict is when uh, this conflict arises when there's personal value that is attached to this ad attitudinal or to the substantive form of the conflict. Now you're emotionally invested in this view, in this prejudice, in this idea that you have 
oh, these people shouldn't do this, and oh, this president should do that, and oh, this pastor shouldn't say this, and oh, this one shouldn't do that. We have emotional investment in certain things, and so that creates conflict. Or we think that there's certain policies or certain ideas that were made and that shouldn't be made, or we think that this should, right? We have these emotions that are driven, or we are driven by emotions. We are more driven by emotions than we are by reason. Jonathan Haidt in his book, The Righteous Mind, speaks about this idea or uses this analogy of a rider on an elephant. He does a ton of research on this idea that we are emotional creatures more than we are rational creatures. We like to think that we are rational creatures and we rationalize everything, but we are more emotional creatures. And so he uses the analogy of the, the rider on an elephant, not a rider on a horse, because he says a rider that's on a horse, even though a horse is strong, is easier maneuverable. But a, a rider on an elephant can guide the elephant, but if the elephant wants to go left, the elephant will go left. And if the elephant wants to go right, the elephant will go right. And so he uses tons of psychological research, and one of them that's quite interesting to me is this idea about your neighbor. Say, I am your neighbor, right? I'm, I am your neighbor, I live next to you, myself and my wife, and we have a dog, we have a Gavoodle, his name is Bam Bam, very cute little puppy, right? Cutest little thing ever. And you see Bam Bam every day that you come out, you play with him, you pet him, you touch him, blah, blah, blah. It's just great, you love this dog as well. Right, and one day you come to us and you yeah, I haven't seen Bam Bam in a while. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's in the house. I'm like, oh, cool, can I come and see him? Yeah, yeah, come in. And I take you to the kitchen and I open the fridge and there you see Bam Bam cut up in pieces. Now, most of you were shocked, yeah? Now, what would you do if I told you, yeah, yeah, do you want a piece? You'd be even more shocked. Why? What if that was a chicken? Would you be shocked then? What if it was a cow? Would you be shocked then? Probably wouldn't, right? Because we are socialized to think, yeah, you can kill a chicken and you can kill, uh, uh, because this is animals that you can eat, but a dog. But what if, you, what if I said to you that I was from a region in the world that eats dogs and there it's pretty normal and you are from that region as well, would that be an issue then? Do you see how social cu cu culturalization and how that plays into our worldview? Now, just for the record, I think it's terrible, right? But his point is this. He says that when, and he's asked this question to thousands of people, and he says every time that he speaks to it in Western cultures, there's an aversion, right? There, there's this disgust. And then he asks them, why are you disgusted? Why do you feel this way? And then they start to rationalize. They don't know why they're disgusted necessarily. They feel disgust, and then they start rationalizing it. Many of the times that we operate, we operate out of emotion and then we rationalize and justify. You know, I heard a thing this week that says rationalize, rationalize, rationalization is when you tell rational lies. Right? So we try to rationalize certain things. And he says that we are, we are this rider on the elephant and, and we need to conduct ourselves to learn how to steer the elephant. The, the, have you ever felt a certain emotion and you don't know why you're feeling it? Maybe something happened, you feel intense anger and you don't wanna always feel this anger. I ha know a person that for many years had very, very extreme outbursts of, outbursts of rage. And this individual was a good Christian that would cr cry and, and weep and say, I don't want to feel this way. I don't know why this happens, but it happens. And then they act in certain ways. And for years, they prayed about it and struggled with this. We are emotive creatures. And now we attach it to these, these attitudes and these other ideas. And so generally, conflict will happen. Conflict will arise with people that, that differ with us. The next one is communication. So not only now do we have these attitudes that we bring to the situation, not only do we have these facts and ideas that we bring to the, the, uh, the, to the situation and these emotions that, that kind of charge them up, but now the way that we communicate these things kind of just messes it up as well. Because as human beings, we communicate through the words that we use and the tone and all of these things, and that is interpreted. All of us interpret stuff. And we all interpret stuff from our perspective. So maybe you grew up in a house where a certain tone or a certain body language or a certain thing was said in a specific way and that elicited certain responses within you and so now this person uses this without even knowing this and they speak in a specific way or talk in a specific way or use a specific word that has nothing to do with the situation but it triggers you and so that creates conflict. Have you experienced this? 
man, we are all a mixed bag of people that struggle with various things that's under the surface. And so conflict arises when all of these things come together. So how should we respond to conflict? Con because conflict will be there. We all have prejudices. We all have paradigms. We all have ideas about stuff. We all believe certain things. We all have certain facts and values within our systems that we like, this is how things should be done, right? We all have emotions that's connected to all of these things. All of us are emotive creatures. All of us have views of certain things. And we all communicate and are communicated. We all interpret. So we all will go through a period of time where we will struggle with conflict. How should we deal with conflict? Now I want to go through the conflict process, how conflict works in the process of conflict. So there's, there's these five lines of the way that conflict works. First there's assumptions, then it moves to context, events, engagement, and conclusion. So the assumptions is all the assumptions that we bring to the situation. That can be our past experiences. Right? This must be a situation that's not even con closely connected to the, what's really happening, but the past experiences add to the situation. Right? So there could be past experiences, whatever they are. Folklore, the way that you grew up and stories that were told to you, like this is the way that things are done. Now, I grew up in South africa with pretty conservative family, Seventh-day Adventists grew up, right? white South Africans grew up there, Afrikaans speaking. right? And the first time that I went overseas, I was like, man, these people are weird. Like, this is, that's not the way you do things. Right? And then I went to another country and I'm like, man, these people are even weirder. Like, that's not, what the, that's not the right way to do things. Like, you don't put toilet paper that way. It turns it, or turn it around. Who puts pineapple on pizza? Come on, that's not, the, right? We have all these ideas that we, we would be willing to die for. Because that's the way we grew up and that's the way you do things. And so you start growing and you start learning and you start connecting. You start to realize, well, but not everything that is different is bad. And sometimes this is the way that we do things, but that's not the way that necessarily needs to be done. Or there's certain stories that were told to you that isn't necessarily the right way. Dr. Nick made a, a, a comment last night at our marriage enrichment program where he, we were speaking, uh, Pastor Peter was speaking about power structures and we were speaking about this concept or we were speaking about a video that was showed. And a, a very powerful point there that was made is that Previous generations, the way that males viewed true masculinity is being deconstructed today. And there's good sides and bad sides to this as well. But that's a good example of folklore. Stories that are told to us, if you want to be a real man, this is what you do. If you want to be a real woman, this is what you do, right? And sometimes we have to deconstruct those ideas, right? And folklore is it not necessarily just cultural things. It could be theological things as well. The other one is authority figures. Right? We've, we assume certain things because authority figures said this to us and so we just believe it. Oh, pastor so-and-so said it. Oh, the president said this. Oh, the health minister said this. Or we have our authority figures that we just bend to and say, oh, we're just gonna follow this person. Our worldview, what we bring to it, how we view this world. Right? The feelings that we bring. This is assumptions as well. Cultural paradigms, theological presuppositions. All of these things, this mixed bag is within you and these are the, the kind of assumptions that you have when you bring something to a situation. Then we get to the actual context. Now the context is kind of what is happening there. So there's firstly the prior experiences of those in the conflict. So it depends on the people that's in the conflict, right? So if it's you and your wife, or you and your husband, or you and your mom and your dad, or your cousin, or the person that's doing the checkout at the counter, whatever it is, it depends. Like if it's just somebody that you don't know, you'll probably be like, oh, it's Kai. Like this is small context, thin, thin story. But it could be your wife that you've had dramas with for the last 30 years, and you're like, man, it is, there's a lot under this hill, right? The second one is the quality of human relationships between them. So maybe everything is good and everything is good. So small little things can stay small little things. Have you ever realized that sometimes big blow-ups happen because of small little things? I know of a situation of a family, Christian, good Christian family, where the daughter moved out of the house and didn't speak to her parents for almost a year because of sugar. So there was this rule within the house that whoever finishes, let's say they had a pot of sugar, and the person that fin takes the last scoop of the sugar needs to go, and they bought, used to buy their sugar in bulk, so they, would, so they would go, and they would have a container full of sugar, and so they would take this small, you had to take this small little um, tub of sugar, and then you had to just fill it. That's what you had to do. That's one of the rules of the house. So whoever finishes the sugar goes and fills it up. 
And so this day, this daughter just said, man, I am tired that I always have to fill up the sugar. And the mom was triggered and she said something. And the daughter said something. And the daughter said, well, if that's the situation, I'm just gonna go. And the mom said, well, if you wanna go, just go. And she went, right? Was it about the sugar? No, it wasn't about the sugar. It was all the stuff that was brewing there for months and for months and for months. It's about the situation between the mother and the daughter. It about all of these things and it coalesced to this situation about the sugar, right? And three, thirdly, the policies and the structures in which they function. That is an example of the policies. Now we all have these things. They're not necessarily written down, but we all have little rules and little things that we believe should and shouldn't be done, right? And if you breach one of these things, these policies, these ideas, then that creates a bit of conflict, right? So the, the context is all of those things. Then, if I can go to the next slide, then this is the event. So before you even get to the event, so take this event of the sugar, right? Before you even get to the event, there were assumptions there. The daughter was having assumptions against her mother. Oh, my mom is this way, my mom is this way. The mom had assumptions towards the daughter. Oh, she's like this, she's like that, la, 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 la. All of this drama that was there. Then there was the context that was surrounding the situation for the last few months or the last few weeks. There's kind of building up and building up and building up. And then bam, there comes the event. And now this conflict. And now what do we do? Because the conflict is now. How do we deal with the conflict right now? How do we deal with it? How do we sort it out, right? And so generally what we do is freeze, right? Have you seen people? Like now you either freeze, we know this, or you flight, right? You flee, you, you go away, or you fight. But all of it starts with a freeze. Have you seen that? Where something happens and everybody's like, first they're like, okay, how fast can I get out of this? Like how fast can I run? Where can I hide? Or if you're a fighter, you'd be like, I'm gonna give you two seconds to say that again before I punch your teeth out, right? There's always this moment of freezing and you're like, say what? And then you are either one of these. Either you're a person that likes to flee, you like to hide, you like to get away from the conflict, or you're a person that says, okay, let me put my coat down because this is, this is rumble in the jungle right now, right? And you know which person you are. And if you're married, you're probably married to the opposite. Right? But there is a fourth way that we should deal with conflict as Christians, and that is freedom. You see, flight is out. Let's get out of this. We don't want to deal with this. Let's move away. Fight is, okay, let's center on this situation. We're going to sort it out now. And freedom is this idea where we are freed from just this emotional pull and say, but there's a new creature within me. There's a new power that is driving me. It is not merely my passions. Now, we are not people that are avoid, uh, devoid of passions. Passions will always be there. Emotions will always be, be there. But that's the power of the Holy Spirit is that he moves within us, that he changes us. A few weeks ago, Boris preached a phenomenal sermon on on slavery, the free slave, right? And he quoted this verse. He quoted this verse, um, Galatians chapter five, verse one. He says, for it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. It is for freedom that you have been set free. Christ had come to reconcile you and make you free. We have a master now, Jesus, but we are free now because we are not under the bondage or the slavery of sin anymore, that we are just moved by our, by our passions and we are just, okay, this is how I should react now. Or this is, no, 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 Jesus gives us another way to react to conflict. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Think about this. If you go back to this idea of flight and fight, This always brings bondage, right? It always brings burdens. It always brings baggage. Oh, you never want to talk about this. Oh, you always want to fight. Right? It brings all of this. But freedom in Christ helps us to break those shackles, to move on, to let go, to forgive. And don't we all need that? Don't we all have baggage that just we just need to let go? That we can just say, it's okay. It's forgiven. I've moved on. By the grace of Christ, I, I, I have found healing. Because that's at the heart of it. Dealing with conflict brings so much pain and heartache and issues. So let's look at this. Let's look at this uh, idea of freedom. So I want to speak about the slippery slope f- between flight and fight and then this idea of freedom that Jesus brings. The first one is the analogy that I want to use is this idea of a turtle. If you're a person that likes to flee, you're generally a turtle, right? You wanna just pull back into your shell, hope that everything goes away, or you can use this idea of an ostrich, like just put your head in the ground, 
right? So there's the flight one, and it starts off with denial. You're like, oh, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. Right, let's not talk about it. It's okay, let's forgive, uh, let's just move on, right? You want to deny that there's a situation. You want to deny that there's a problem. The next one is flight. You just want to get out of the situation. You want to get out of the relationship. You want to get out of the, the maybe it's an immediate situation that you need to get out of, but you just want to flee. The most extreme version of flight is probably suicide. Where the conflict in, internally or externally in your life is just so much that you're like, man, I just, wanna, I just wanna flee out of life. That's the ultimate, right? Now this is natural for all of us. This is natural for all of us to some degree to be either a, a, um, a turtle that you wanna flee from conflict, you're, you're conflict avoidant, you don't like conflict, right? Or the other one is that you're a skunk, right? A skunk just comes and just stinks up the place. Right? So a skunk, what they do is they first want to litigate. They want to fight. They want to get into this, right? They want to, they want to make sure that they, their voice is heard and nobody will go against them. You're, what is litigation? Litigation is fighting against another person. Right? Adversarial. Litigation is always adversarial. And what is, the, what, is the, what is the first thing that a lawyer would say to you when you enter into litigation? What do you say? Don't talk. Don't talk to them. Don't talk, I will do the talking, you don't talk to them. Don't, don't engage in conversation. That's the opposite of what Jesus tells us. Now, I wanna say this. There are certain times where flight is important. Like, I'm not completely dismissing the idea that flight is completely wrong. There are certain things that you have to flee. For instance, there's a story in the Bible where Joseph is in a situation with Potiphar's wife. What does he do there? He flees. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing, right? There are other situations where litigation is maybe a thing that we should follow. Right? Now Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we, should not, that we should not sue each other as Christians. Right? And we'll speak about that later. But it, the idea that we should also just roll over is not what this passage is about. I'm just kind of speaking in broad terms here. But we should not be, have this kind of accusatory frame, frame set. The other one is assault. We just want to you know, roll, roll up your, your, your shirt and get the glove box, gloves out. Right? You want to get violent. But the thing about violence is that it doesn't necessarily have to be physically violent. The word violent means to violate. And can you think of other ways that you can violate somebody? Yeah, emotional, emotional. So think about ways of emotional violation. Yeah, breaking them down, speaking ill of them. What are other ways of violating people? Doing violence towards them. Emotional violence, say again. Gossip, yeah. Gossip is a big one, right? Your character assassinating them, slandering them. Interestingly enough, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 28, which gives the modus operandi of the devil, of how he operates, the thing that really got him on, on the track there was to slander, to character assassinate Christ. At the heart of the great controversy is this idea that God is not good, that God is not good towards you, that God is not good towards this world, that God doesn't like you, that God hates you, that God is angry with you, that God is this vengeful God. Where does this idea come from? From the slander of the devil, right? The word devil, the word devil, diablos, means to throw mud, the mudslinger. The word Satan, hasatan, the Satan in the Hebrew, means the one that accuses. Interesting, isn't it? How these things are connected to this idea of fighting and violence, right? So assault can be a thing. Spiritual, can, we, can, can there be spiritual assault? Where we use certain things in our way of political maneuvering and slandering and all of these to get political or, 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 or um, spiritual things? Yeah, we can use assault in various ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical. And then the next one is homicide or murder, right? That's the extreme of, of, of fighting. But Jesus tells us to go to the middle one, to freedom. And, and we'll delve into this more and more in the next few weeks. Um, I'm just kind of giving a, a brief over, over cap, uh, overlook. So the first one you in freedom is this idea that we should overlook a situation. Maybe it's so small that you're like, hey, this is, I'm not gonna be offended by this. Yeah, it's okay, let's overlook this, right? Proverbs says this. Proverbs says in Proverbs 19 verse 11, good sense, make, uh, good sense makes one slow to anger. Some translations say wisdom. Wisdom Makes, makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. So that's okay. It's like this is something small. 
no harm, no foul. Sometimes it's okay to overlook a situation, right? Then if that doesn't work, maybe there's some reason for discussion, right? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 that if there's a situation, go and speak to your brother. Go talk to him. Now, I want you to see the escalation here in numbers. Firstly, it speaks about overlooking. That is just what you can do. That doesn't involve anybody. That's just you, where you say, it's okay. The next one in discussion, it's just you and another person. It is not the whole church. It is not the, the, the whole community. It's not your neighbor. It's not the, the coworker and all of these people that are forming a committee to discuss what's happening. No, no, no. It's between you and that person. One-on-one. -on -one. If that doesn't work, well, then you go to negotiating. Now you're getting to three. So first it starts off with overlooking. Then it starts with, this, the, uh, with discussion. Then it starts, uh, sorry, this negotiation is also just two. You can negotiate and say, hey, there's been a situation here, and maybe it's not enough to say, let's just forgive and forget. Maybe there needs to be some negotiation. You just bumped into my car, and hey, it was an accident, but who's going to pay for this? Let's negotiate. Let's talk, right? Sometimes negotiation is important. But if that doesn't work, then you move on to mediation, where, okay, this is not working. We're not getting to a head. Let's, let's get a third person in and let them help us with the situation. Let them mediate. Now, what, what's the difference between mediation and arbitration? Mediation is that person is just a facilitator to facilitate communication and discussion. He doesn't tell you what you need to do. He just helps the two parties to come together and speak through it. Right, and say, okay, well, well you, okay, what do you think? Or what do you, right? He's just facilitating the situation. But if that doesn't work, then you move to arbitration, where you now get somebody in that will listen to the situation and say, okay, this is what you need to do. And then from arbitration, if that doesn't work, you move to church discipline. So this is what it means to deal with conflict as a Christian. You start off. Now, I want to ask you a question. When you look at this, do you think that you deal with conflict this way? That you say, oh, is this something that I can overlook? Okay, this is something small, ins insignificant. Or do you say, okay, yeah, there's been this definitely something that, that is, needs to be discussed. And do you go to that person? And do you talk to them one-on-one? -on -one? And do you start negotiating with them? And say, how, how can we deal with this? And if that doesn't work, do you escalate it further? Or do you first go to this person and that person and that person and this person and you know, kind of get your buddies on your side and make them to get their buddies on their side and now there's a rift and now there's an issue and this person says this person about this person and it's just chaos. And the scripture says that's not the way that we should deal with conflict. Because as Christians, there's a different ethos that we are called to. Now, the key thing of all of this is that I hope we start seeing that conflict starts, conflict resolution starts with us. Realizing that we have baggage that we bring to the situation. We have paradigms and prejudices and we have emotions and we have thoughts and all of these things that might not be correct. That we have to say to ourselves, hey, am I in check first? The first thing about Christian conflict resolution is to look at myself and see maybe I am the problem. To look at myself and say, maybe I need to change. Maybe I need to understand how good God's grace is towards me before I act ungraciously towards other people. There's this idea where these four quadrants and the way that you should deal with it. The first one is that you, you have a care personality. You care for people, but this can be ruinous empathy. This is when you're an enabler. You just let it go. Ah, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You enable their bad um, uh, um, behaviors, their bad thinking. Right? This, can be, this can be bad for them as well, as it is for you. It can be damaging. It can be, it can be uh, uh, abusive. Right? Or on the other side, you want to challenge. So you can have manipulative insincerity. So you're insincere because you want to manipulate the situation. Ah, oh, it's okay, it's okay, but don't worry, I'm going to get you. You don't know when, but I'm going to get you. Right? Or you can have this obnoxious aggression where you don't care what you say because you're speaking truth. Right? But the sweet spot for the Christian is this radical candor where we have this really deep care personality and challenge them directly. Jesus would put it this way, or Alan White would put it this way, that Jesus, when he spoke to people, he never spoke a, a severe word without tears in his eyes, thinking of the most positive way that he could put it, ways that would not unneedingly censure them. Now, did Jesus censure? Yes. Did he speak words that were hard to hear? Yes. But he didn't just speak it in a tone that was negative and bad. He always sought in ways to redeem, to reconcile, to draw. 
And that's what, Christ, that's what Christianity is about. That is what Christ is calling us to. He actually preaches about this in the Sermon on the Mount, his great ethics of the kingdom. He speaks about this idea, right? He starts off with the, with the kingdom ethics and he speaks, or speaks about the character that needs to, to be there. And there's a progression there in, this, in, this fruit of, um, in the Sermon on the Mount. He starts off with the, the roots of a blessed and godly life, right? He says that, first off, you must be poor in spirit. Then he says that you need to mourn. If you're poor in spirit, you, need, you know that you're in need. You know that you are desperate. And then you start mourning for this because you, you realize that you are not as good as you think you are. You don't know as much as you think you know. That you are desperately a wicked sinner that you need God's grace. That brings you to meekness. To realize how small you are in the universe. How dark your sin is. How wicked your actions are. That even your best, best, best thing is but like filthy rags. And then when you realize that, you will move on to the shoot of a blessed life, where you start hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You start growing out. You start realizing, man, I need this. I don't have this in, my, in myself. I don't possess this by myself. I need this strongly by Jesus and his, and his indwelling power through the Holy Spirit. You start thirsting and hungering. Now, have you ever been hungry or have you ever been thirsty? What do you do when you're hungry or you're thirsty? Do you sit down and say, oh, man, I'm so hungry. I wish I could eat someday. No, what do you do? You do something. You go out, you look for water, you look for food, right? You search hungering and thirsting, right? And as you seek God, who's the bread of life and the spring of eternal water, you go to him, you are filled. And that starts bringing fruits of a blessed life where you'll start experiencing mercy and forgiveness. As you go to him, you experience the forgiveness and the mercy that he has towards you. You experience that and you enjoy that. Eventually, you start to become pure. And as you become pure, you'll eventually have peace. Because you know how bad you were and how good God is making you. You know how his goodness is towards you. And after Jesus goes through all of this and he says that there's peace, he says, but remember, you will still be persecuted, right? There will be insults and persecution and slander. People will come after you because the way that you live in this world is different than the world will live. And people don't like this because it's different, but people will come for you. And then he says right after this, you are the salt of the earth. What is salt? Salt brings flavor, brings goodness. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is of no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under food. There's a warning there. Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth. You have gone through this process of character development. You have gone through this process of, of experiencing the justification and sanctifying power of God's grace. Now that you have the give it to the world, be the sanctifying power, be the this, this sweet aroma to this world, be the salt that will just permeate the world where people are like, man, these people are good. Man, I love being in the midst of Christians because this, this just gives a good space. I love this. I love the taste that it gives in my life. And then he goes on and he says, and you are like the lights of the world in this, light, this, this world that is so dark that they cannot see any goodness. You are supposed to be the lights in the world. How do they see that? Not individually you necessarily, but you corporately. The way that you come together, the way that you deal with yourself. You are the lights of the world. A town. That is, that is built, uh, built on a hill, cannot be hidden. If you live this way, people will see. People will know. I am a Christian today because of two individuals that had a conflict with each other. Right? I was a, I was a Christian, or I was a, raised a Seventh-day Adventist, but I didn't really want anything to do with the church, and I was on my way out of church when a friend of mine, one of my best friends became a missionary a few months before that, and he had went away for training and whatever. They came back for, for doing missionary activities in the town that I lived in. I went with them just because he was my friend, so I just went around and kind of chilled with them. And there were two girls that had conflict with each other. And I saw the way that these two girls dealt with conflict with each other. And at that moment, I was going through severe conflict with various people in my life. And I just couldn't figure out why what's going on. And I saw the way that these people were dealing with each other, the way that they dealt with conflict. I'm like, man, I want that. I want to experience that kind of grace, that kind of forgiveness. And I said, man, yeah, I, I, I want to follow this. There's something here. Then, that was the Thursday, the Saturday night. We were still sitting together, we were talking having a good time, spending time with them. They got in a car, these missionaries, 
left from Johannesburg all the way to Cape Town. The next morning at 8 o'clock, uh, we got a phone call that they had been in an accident, and those two girls died. And I thought to myself, wow. And what was more impressive is to see how through that cosmic conflict, these people dealt with it. The, the parents weren't angry with God. They were devastated. They were hurt. They were struggling. But they had faith in God. Because they knew how God had changed their children's lives. They knew that, that these people were living a life that we have all been called to live like. And they too have experienced the grace and the mercy the justification, sanctification of Christ. And so even through that conflict, they dealt with it differently. And through that whole process, I was observing the way that these Christians were dealing with stuff, with conflict in their lives, interpersonal conflict, cosmic conflict, and it was just different than what I was used to. And I was like, man, I want that. And I made a commitment then to become a Christian. People see us as Christians. And they make a decision for or against Christ by the way that we live. May we glorify Christ in everything that we do. Paul says whether you eat or whether you drink, the way that you speak to each other, the way that you deal with each other, May all and everything that you do bring honor and glory to God. Ask yourself this. The way that I deal with the conflict in my life, interpersonal, intrapersonal, external, marriage, children, friends, family, church family, is it the way that Christ would deal with it? Is it a way that shines a light in this dark world? Does it bring a flavor to this world that is sweet and delicious? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we come to you and we say thank you, Lord, for this new way. For a way that is so foreign to us, so different than us, so unnatural to a degree, Lord, but when we are when we are born again, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to do the right thing. And yes, Lord, we still struggle. We still mess up. We still do things and say things. And we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us and that we, we can extend that forgiveness to others. We pray, Lord, that we would be the kind of Christians that you have called us to be, that we would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. These aren't just nice little sayings that we say to each other, but this is your vision of the church. This is your vision of Kingscliff Church, not as an organization, but as a people. That the people in this church will be known as people that love each other because their God loves them and they love him. May we make you proud in Jesus' name, amen.